So, what do you think of the live action One Piece? It was good. I know <laughs> the reason I pause to say that is because, like, I think for a non One Piece fan, this is a great way to get into One Piece. Right? It condenses a lot of stuff and makes the characters seem silly and larger than life. And I think that can really draw in new new readers, new watchers. For someone who's a fan, I think it's also good, but it I think it has just enough cool callbacks and throwbacks that fans would notice that fans of One Piece can enjoy watching it as well. Although I, there are some parts that I didn't I didn't really vibe with. I agree. That's basically my assessment too, is that like it, I enjoyed it, that it is definitely one of the better live action adaptations that I've seen. And as someone who is like clearly obsessed with One Piece, I, I thought it was really good. There are some things I don't like about it. I mean there's some things that I don't like about the actual One Piece also, so you know, it's it is what it is. It is what it is. But it's a, it's a shame that they only got through Arlong Park because they don't get to see some of the really cool stuff like we're about to see in this episode. So there was this guy named Gold Roger and he left a bunch of treasure when he died. After that, they meet a talking reindeer who's actually a doctor. But then a giant bear man sends Luffy to an island of Amazonian women. So an evil ghost scientist accidentally turns the son of a samurai into a dragon. Then, the Straw Hats become world famous after crashing a wedding. And that's how Luffy becomes King of the Pirates! Last episode we finished off in Arlong Park, and the Straw Hats are now moving towards the Grand Line, officially. Finally, officially, for real, going to the Grand Line. But before we even get to there, I do want to talk about something called a cover story. So this is something that Oda does from time to time, where he likes to show off the role of One Piece, particularly the characters that we've already seen, and give them their own little story that is happening while the main story is going on, so they're not interrupting the story and he does this by giving them an opening page over a certain number of chapters it could be like 20 chapters it could be like 40 it really depends on what story he's telling here in this case this is the buggy's crew adventure chronicles cover story in which over the last 20 or so chapters we have learned what happened to buggy and his crew after luffy defeated them and so after luffy does defeat buggy and sends him flying he starts a quest to find the rest of his body and his crew. Right now, he's just a little tiny little man with a head, an arm, two arms, and a le and his two feet. Not even his legs, just his two feet. And he goes through a lot of wacky hijinks, including almost being eaten by a bird, getting attacked by a giant crab, and washing ashore to the island of rare animals, where he bonds with Gaimon over their similar body dispositions. Uh, <laughs> and he even asks them to join his crew, which he de he he uh, he denies. He says, "No, I'm busy Aww. here defending the island." But thank you anyway, so... Gaimon stocks are up. That's two people who asked Gaimon to be on his crew. Buggy also meets a beautiful young woman who seems interested in finding Luffy for some reason. And they both bond over that. Meanwhile, Kabaji and Moji are distraught over their captain being missing. And they fight over who should become the new leader of the crew. With Richie eventually becoming captain, actually. <laughs> However, that doesn't seem to last very long, and Richie and the rest of the crew are captured by cannibals? Luckily, Buggy does show up at the perfect time, regains his body, and saves his crew from being eaten, having picked up a mysterious new member along the way. So back in the actual timeline, um, as the crew sails away from the victory over Arlong in Coco Village, Nami buys a newspaper from a courier bird, and we learn some interesting facts about the One Piece world. First off, we learn that Luffy has a bounty. This was Nozomi's uh, final act of revenge against Luffy, the thing that he told him about end of Arlong Park. However, Luffy is excited. It's a 30 million berry bounty, which is the largest bounty in the East Blue, the largest one that we have seen up to this point. And it means that Luffy is a very serious threat for uh, a new pirate. And he's excited about it. Uh, he's excited about it. Usopp's excited about it because his head's in the background. And he claims that it is his bounty, even though it is very clearly Luffy's bounty. Zoro and Sanji are kind of indifferent about it. But Nami is worried because this now means that not only is the Marines after them, but also powerful bounty hunters that this will cause a lot of trouble for them, even though this is kind of the typical procedure for a pirate. So she's just kind of 
over like overwhelmingly uh, worried for really no reason. I also want to point out here in this moment when she is talking about the newspaper and reading it, she makes this very small comment. She says, there's a coup d'etat happening in the country of Vera. And this country of Vera will not, not be important. It means nothing. But the idea of uprisings and insurrections in the world of One Piece will become a major theme moving forward. And this is the first time that we really see that, although it is it is extremely minor um, and very quick. Like It's a blink and you miss it sort of moment. Then back at Marine HQ, um, a lot of Marines are gathered together and talking about how their branch units couldn't beat these pirates in the East Blue, but this random one pirate came along. And this is a shame on the world government. And also, this doesn't mean anything about Luffy that he still needs to be captured. And I also want to point out here, this is a very, very good detail to world building. They only attribute the defeats of Buggy, Krieg, and Arlong to Luffy because they still believe Kuro is dead. They have no reason to believe that Axan Morgan was wrong and that Kuro was not actually captured and executed three years ago. So Kuro, had Kuro been counted, Luffy's bounty probably would have been even higher than it is now. But we also do this, this happens every so often, whenever Luffy gets a new bounty, we have a little fun montage of some of Luffy's uh, allies and friends over the years. So of reacting to his bounty. So the first one we see is on a random island somewhere, Mihawk, of all people, is delivering Luffy's wanted poster to Shanks, who seems very excited about Luffy finally getting his first bounty. And they throw a party to celebrate Luffy becoming a real man, a real pirate. It was weird, the panels for this. Mihawk showing Shanks the bounty, Luffy's bounty. Shanks and his crew are drawn with a lot of shadows on them, and they look kind of scary. Back in Fuchsia Village, you know, Shanks's crew are, were this lighthearted bunch that were like happy and excited and friendly but here it Oda kind of drew them menacingly to kind of show that they are a threat. Yes and actually some of the random like unnamed pirates seem pretty scared by Mihawk but Yasop, Lucky Rue, and Ben Beckman the officers of Shanks's crew seem completely unfazed um, they're just sitting relaxed they don't really care and Shanks makes a comment saying that he doesn't have time uh, or the energy to fight Mihawk right now and Mihawk says that's fine I don't challenge uh, one arm has bends anymore anyway. The ableism. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, not only, this is a nod not only to Mihawk's strength, but also Shanks' strength, because this says that before Shanks lost his arm, Mihawk would seek him out for sparring matches. So, like, the greatest swordsman in the world thinks highly enough of Shanks to consider him a rival in a way. But now he's handicapped, so he doesn't care anymore. <laughs> um, and then also we see in Luffy's hometown, uh, Fusha Village, everyone seems to be pretty excited about this this idea that he's he's done it. He's he's done his dream. He's on his way to becoming a very famous pirate. However, the mayor, Whoopslap, is not happy and is very worried that Luffy's bounty will cause issues for Fusha Village and at least will bring shame on on Fusha Village. So what's happening with the crew at this point in time? At the current moment, the crew, they pull up to an island called Log Town or Log Town rather. Uh, in some translations like the four kids translation, it's actually Rogue Town, but the official translation is Log Town, Log Town because it's the town of beginnings and ends like epilogue and prologue. So. This town is where Roger was born and executed, kicking off the age of piracy that's happening now in the story. And Luffy, he seems like uncharacteristically reverent to go to the island and see the scaffolding where Roger was executed. So they get to this town and everyone kind of decides to split up to buy supplies for, you know, whatever they're interested in. Sanji, you know, he wants to get cooking supplies. More importantly, Zoro, he he needs new swords because in the last arc, his swords got destroyed. So he decides to go find a shop where he can find those. So the crew splits up and on the way to find a shop that sells swords, Zoro ends up seeing these two goons harassing a slender looking woman with glasses. And she's carrying like a satchel like a almost like a something you would carry baseball bats or something in right and 
these two goons, they attack this woman. And as they attack her, she pulls out a sword out of the satchel and slices them to pieces, basically. However, after she, like, gets done slicing them up, she trips and falls. And her glasses are sent flying. And Zoro sees this and he walks up, he picks up her glasses and helps her up. The woman, like, thanks him profusely. He's like, you know, that was weird. That was a weird little excursion that happened, but he's still on a mission to find his new swords. So after helping this mystery woman, he kind of remarks that she looked a lot like his childhood friend Kuina. And as he's reminiscing about Kuina, he ends up finding a sword shop that has a kind of grimy guy as the shopkeeper. He tells the shopkeeper that he needs two swords. He only has 100,000 berries though. Like, he's broke. The shopkeeper says, Bruh, you can't get two swords with 100,000 berries. Like, get your broke ass out of here. Come back when you have more money, right? However, as he's saying this, he manages to spot the sword on Zoro's waist. And he recognizes it immediately as a legendary sword. And he tries to bring Zoro back into his shop. He's like, Hey, bruh, maybe if you trade in that sword on your waist, you know... I could get you three lesser quality swords, you know? I think that would be worth it. And just as Zoro is about to tell him it's not for sale, the woman he met earlier, the mystery woman, the mystery swords woman, burst in. She rushes up to the counter where they're looking at Zoro's sword, and she proclaims that the sword is the Wado Ichimonji, which is the straight road of peace. It's one of the 21 excellent great swords and is worth like 10 million berries. And the shop owner, he gets a bit mad at this because he was trying to finesse Zoro out his cash, out his sword, you know, by giving him a shitty deal. He tosses her the sword that she came to pick up, which is called Autumn Rain, and he tells her to get out. Before she does this, she recognizes Zoro as the guy who helped her get her glasses earlier and she sees the three scabbards on his waist and she's like you know who else has three scabbards you know there's this guy called the pirate hunter zoro and he also has three scabbards he also uses the three sword style and he's like a master swordsman in the east blue however she then starts saying that she doesn't like this pirate hunter zoro because he uses his swords to make money and she finds that unforgivable she says that all the famous swordsmen nowadays are either pirates or bounty hunters and all the most famous swords are in their hands and she says that the swords must be crying you know to be used by these people the shopkeeper he's listening to this and he butts in and he says you know i kind of like those people I like those bad guys because they used to come in my shop, you know, trying to conquer the Grand Line and they would buy stuff. All of that was before a certain monster took over the town. The girl hearing that perks up and she proclaims that, yeah, Captain Smoker has a devil fruit, but he's not a monster. And Zoro hears this and he kind of like perks up too because he hears like devil fruit and he's like, Hmm, that's interesting. You have to understand at this point in the story, like, devil fruits are supposed to be, uh, rare. The girl, she yells that she'll use her sword, Autumn Rain, that she just got, to collect all the famous swords that have fallen into the hands of evil men. This is the point where she drops the knowledge on the different sword grades in One Piece. So, there are 12 supreme grade swords. There are 21 excellent great swords, and there are 50 fine great swords. For reference, Mihawk's sword, Yoru, the one on his back that he like slashed Zoro with, that's a supreme great sword. They don't reveal that till quite later, but um, just for context, like that is the level of sword we're talking about for supreme grade, and Zoro is the one of Ichimonji, which is one step below that. That's the difference in level that we're talking about when we talk about supreme grade and excellent great sword. Zoro asks her, you know, are you gonna come collect my sword because it's an excellent great sword? Are you gonna come collect the Wado Ichimonji? And she replies that she doesn't want all the swords, she just wants to make sure that evil men don't have them. At this point in time, the woman starts looking through the bargain bin. She pulls out one of the swords from the bin and she proclaims that it's called Kotetsu the Third, 
and that it's a fine great sword and that Zoro should take it because the rest of the swords are kind of garbage but this sword's the fine grade which is one underneath the sword that Zoro currently has the Wado Ichimonji. The owner he gets pissed at this and he starts telling them that he can't sell the sword. He can't sell that specific sword. And Zoro's like, why? Because the sword's bewitched? And the shopkeeper, he's kind of shocked by this. He's shocked that Zoro could tell that the sword has like a curse on it. And so he goes into explaining a little bit about the curse that's on the sword. Basically, any swordsman that picks up the swords and uses it, they all end up with a tragic death. And he wants to get rid of it, but he's afraid that if he does, he might get cursed himself. But Zoro, he's like, you know, fuck the curse. I'm kind of vibing with this sword right now, and he decides he wants to take it. And the shopkeeper tries to keep him, like, tries to talk him out of it, but Zoro's dead set. Zoro decides to, like, test his luck versus the sword's curse. So what Zoro does is he sticks his arm out, or first he tosses the sword up, unsheath, and then he sticks his arm out to see whether or not the sword will like cut his arm off or not. And what ends up happening is the sword gets tossed into the air and it flips down and it flips completely around his arm and sinks like almost down to the hilt into the ground. At this point, the girl watching this the swordswoman she's shocked she's like on the floor shocked that Zora would like do something so stupid but the shopkeeper seeing the display of bravery that Zoro just did he decides to go in the back and he brings out another sword for Zoro it's called Rubashiri and it's another fine great sword it's the best sword that the shopkeeper has at the moment and he wants to give it to Zoro for free because it's been a while since he's seen a real swordsman come into his shop. It's also a form of apology for trying to scam him earlier. Because he didn't realize, he assumes Zoro didn't know how good his sword was. When clearly he understood how good the water Jimoji was. And so as, as an apology for distracting a real swordsman, he gives him both these swords for free. Building on that, he knows that Zoro's a real swordsman because a sword chooses its wielder. And Zoro knew this. That's why he gave the sword the test of whether or not it would cut off his arm or not. So after seeing that, the shopkeeper knows that Zoro's a real swordsman. So Zoro now leaves this shop with two swords on his hip that he didn't even have to pay for. He's chilling, bro. Like, he, he just got two free swords. He met a cool chick. He's having a good time. So we cut to Luffy. Luffy is at the scaffold where Roger was executed. And he's kind of staring at it in awe because this is the spot where the great age of piracy started. Luffy's kind of staring up at this scaffolding and he decides to climb it. So he goes and he, he climbs the scaffolding and he's at the top and he's kind of just enjoying the view. And this kind of pisses off the townspeople and it causes like a, a ruckus in the town. Just then, a beautiful woman pulls up. She declares to Luffy that it's been a long time. And Luffy's like, who the fuck are you? Notably, this is the woman from the cover story. The same woman from the cover story that met Buggy. Yes. And we're about to find out who she is. So Luffy's like, who the fuck are you? And the woman reveals herself to be Captain Alvida. She's looking completely brand new. She easily takes out a squadron of police officers who are after her. And even though Luffy heard her say oh yeah i'm captain alvita is me captain alvita he still doesn't believe it's her right he's like alvita where he starts looking this is the point where alvita reveals that she's eaten the slip slip fruit basically any attack that goes her way just slips off her now and it's not mentioned here but basically the reason why she looks so different is because she was like big boned at first right she was uh she was a heavy set lady but after she ate the slip slip fruit the weight just slipped off her which is an insane thing <laughs> like yeah it's super weird only in one piece i guess this is something that happens right so now she looks like a model and the police are after her and trying to attack her, but their attacks are just slipping off of her. And at this point, she reveals that she's teamed up with Buggy. Buggy was standing behind her in a cloak, and the rest of Buggy's crew was in a cloak behind her as well. And they 
at this point shed their cloaks and reveal themselves. Buggy and his crew and Alvita at this point start to wreak havoc in the town square. Buggy and his crew, they've captured Luffy and they have him in stocks on top of the scaffolding where Roger was executed. And Buggy has decided to execute him just like Roger, right? They're in the same place that Roger was executed and they're going to execute Luffy here as well. The Marines, seeing all this havoc happen in the town square, rush to tell Captain Smoker, who we heard about earlier in the sword shop, they decide to tell this Captain Smoker the news about what's going on in the town square. And so what Captain Smoker, what he looks like, he looks like a rough and tough kind of dude. He has white hair and he has two cigars always in his mouth. And he wears like a military style jacket with no, no shirt. shirt. He he's proud of his washboard app. He worked hard for them. Like he could be a Abercrombie and Fitch model if he wanted to. If it wasn't for all the smoking, I would assume. So the Marines come in and they tell Captain Smoker that the pirates are causing a ruckus in the town square. And he orders them to go to the area and like stop them, but also to surround all the ports just in case any pirates try to escape. This is the point where we find out that the swordswoman that we met in the sword shop with Zoro is actually Master Chief Petty Officer Toshigi and she works under Smoker. And it's a bit weird their relationship like he treats her kind of like shit or kind of like a bumbling idiot and like she's always very apologetic towards him. Like, she seems very nervous, except when it's a fight, which we'll see pretty soon. So on the way to the town square, Smoker accidentally uh, bumps into this little girl and knocks over her ice cream. And they look at each other in this very intense scene where she's, like, really scared, and he's, like, is a very scary man. And he, like, leans down to her, pats her on the head and says, I'm sorry, my pants ate all of your ice cream. Next time, get five scoops. And he hands her more money to go buy more ice cream and this is very reminiscent of Zoro and Rika where like there's these big tough dudes that Oda loves drawing and but when you put them next to little kids they just like melt away and are very sweet and I think this will be important later on Smoker will be a recurring character spoiler he is a marine who is an antagonist to Luffy but he's not like other marines and I think letting him have this moment of humanity where he is just like nice is important for his characterization. Yeah, it's how Oda shows that they're not bad guys. That they're scary, but they're not bad guys. So the crew who've all been on their little shopping sprees, they all meet up in the town square to find Luffy on the chopping block about to get executed. And just then, like, storm clouds start to roll in as Buggy announces to the world that he's about to execute Luffy. And... At this moment, Nami and Usopp decide to run back to the ship because Nami feels the air pressure change and she's sure that a huge storm is about to hit the island. And she wants to make sure that the Going Mary is safe when this happens. So Nami and Usopp take off running towards the ship, leaving Sanji and Zoro. Smoker and his marines are all watching this all go down and a marine asks Smoker if he should intervene. And Smoker's just like, let the pirates kill each other. You know, once Luffy's head hits the pavement, we'll bust in there and take out Buggy and Alvita. It's kind of funny, Luffy is like mad confused about how execution works because he's never seen an execution. He doesn't know how it works. So he's just like asking Buggy questions and Buggy's getting pissed off about it. And eventually Buggy gets so pissed off that he asks Luffy if he has any last words while raising his sword towards his neck. People have got to stop asking this. If you are at an execution platform, please stop asking these people if they have any last words. It's never a good idea. It never goes well for them. Just let, just kill them. Just fucking do it. It's like the, it's like the anime rule where you gotta let them monologue, the villain monologue before you hit them. Yes, just hit them. Just kill them. Don't ask him if it's any last words. We saw what happened the last time someone was killed in this exact spot. It's not going to go well. True. Luffy's about to enter the next 
create the next wave of piracy. Actually, he doesn't have enough clout to do that, so never mind. Not yet. That's, that's the story, baby. So, Buggy asks Luffy for any last words as he's about to chop his head off. And Luffy, of course, what does he yell out? Say it with me, class. I'm, I'm going to be, be king of the pirates. I'm going to be king of the pirates. Exactly. At this point, Zoro and Sanji yell to stop the execution. And they start kicking ass, beating Buggy's goons. Side note, this is where Toshigi, because she's with Smoker overlooking everything. This is where Toshigi, the sword girl, notices that the man she met was Zoro. And now Zoro is no longer a bounty hunter. It seems like he's a pirate under Luffy. And she kind of gets upset at this because she had that whole spiel about, you know, the special swords nowadays are either pirates or bounty hunters. It turns out he's both. Especially she's angry that she explicitly mentioned Zoro and he just like laughed at her and was like, oh, I know that name pretty well and just didn't reveal himself to her. But he points out, he's like, well, I, I didn't know you were a Marine. So I guess we're even. So Luffy at this moment has a smile on his face and he apologizes to his crew as the sword is coming down towards his neck. He laughs and he says, sorry, I'm a goner. And just as Buggy brings the sword down onto his neck, boom, lightning strikes the scaffolding. It starts to rain and out of the rain, Luffy steps out unharmed because he's a rubber man. He picks up his straw hat and he laughs about how lucky he is, right? Buggy is on the fucking ground. Like, he's just laid out on the platform. The whole- Actually, the platform's destroyed. He's just laid out on the ground, like, smoking. Also, exactly. So also, when the lightning struck him, he caught on fire. So Luffy was lucky. Buggy, not so much, right? Everyone in the audience is shocked at this. Sanji asks Zoro if he believes in a higher power after seeing this. And Zoro just shrugs it off and says he doesn't have time for this bullshit. At this point, Zoro, Sanji, and Luffy begin to run to their ship. Smoker, who is watching all this go down, like he was waiting for Luffy's head to drop as the signal to go in and catch Buggy and Alvita. He's like intrigued when he saw this all go down because 22 years ago, in this exact spot, another man laughed right as he was about to be executed. You know who that man was? Ooh, ooh, can I say it? Can I say it? Gold Roger! Gold there we Roger. go. Gold Roger, the king of the pirates. So, he activates his marines. He's like, we still have a job to do. We still have pirates to catch. So he activates his marines, and they have to go and stop the pirates from escaping the island. Right? That's their job. At this point, we cut to a man in a cloak walking in the rain. He has a tribal tattoo on his face and he's smiling. Cut back to the town square, however, it's pandemonium. Buggy has revived and he's pissed about the fact that Luffy escaped. The marines, however, are on them and they have to make their escape now. So Buggy turns himself into a fucking car and Alvita takes off her shoes and because she has to slip slip fruit, she's able to skate away with Buggy right behind her. Before they can get far, however, Smoker reveals his devil fruit and captures them in a plume of smoke. Smoker has the... The plume plume fruit. I just call it the smoke smoke fruit. Funny enough, that was actually the name in the 4Kids dub and it was called the plume plume fruit in the Viz manga and the Funimation sub and dub. I honestly prefer Smoker smoke smoke fruit just because it it sounds cooler and it's it's more straightforward and he's smoker <laughs> okay yeah so he reveals his devil fruit the smoke smoke fruit or plum plum fruit if you want to be technically correct and buggy and avita they get put in this like sea stone net that prevents them from using their powers and escaping yeah so sea stone is a material to in one piece that is a stone like material that has the properties of the sea so when things are lined or tipped with it like this net is a steel net that's lined with sea stone then it has the powers of the sea and it negates devil fruit users powers and makes them weak and so buggy and alvita are trapped in this net and cannot escape because they can't use their powers anymore luffy and the boys are running to the ship when Tishigi steps in their way and she's pissed at Zoro for not telling her that he was a pirate and she says she's going to take the Wado Ijimonji from him because he's revealed himself to be an evil man. Zoro tells the homies, don't worry about this, I got it, and to run on without them, without him. And Zoro and Tishigi throw hands, right? They take out the swords, they start throwing hands. 
However, Zoro makes quick work of her, subduing her pretty easily, mind you. And he, like, stabs at her, but, like, he does that anime thing where he, like, stabs next to their head instead of their actual head. You know, he's like, give up, you know, I could have killed you if I wanted to, right? And Toshigi's, she's pissed at this. She asks, like, why didn't, why don't you kill me? Is it because I'm a woman that you're going easy on me, right? And this pisses Zoro off, and he's he starts yelling at her for copying his dead friend. And Toshiga doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, right? So he's just like, you know, stop copying her, stop copying her, and he, and she's like, who the fuck are you talking about? Like, I don't know. Yeah, she says that she's the real victim, and that his friend was copying her. It's a little weird. She's a weird lady. I mean, Zoro's weird. Like, I don't know. It's basically it was a lovers quarrel. Like it seems like they're trying to set up Zoro X Tashigi, but certainly early on, because uh, she looks just like Kalina. So, cut to Luffy and Sanji running, and Smoker has caught up to them and attacks. Luffy and Sanji try to fight back, but they can't hit Smoker because his body is just keeps turning into smoke. And then when they attack him, they miss, right? And then the smoke hardens around them, capturing them. When it seems all hope is lost and they are defeated, a man appears behind Smoker. It's the man with the tribal tattoo on his face. Smoker is shocked that he would be here and the man attacks him with a wind blast, basically. Blasting him off Luffy and Sanji. Coincidentally, the wind blast also knocks the netting off of Buggy and Alvita as well. Smoker asks the man why he would save these kids. The man replies, who is he to keep a man from their voyage? At this moment, Zoro runs into frame and picks Luffy up as well as kind of Sanji and the three of them run to the Going Merry where they find Usopp and Nami waiting for them. They need to leave now as the storm is getting really bad. At this moment, we kind of cut back to, to Smoker who seems fired up. He's decided that he's going to chase the Straw Hat Pirates down, even if they're headed out of his jurisdiction. And what's out of his jurisdiction? The Grand Line. When Luffy escapes, Smoker points out that they have a tailwind towards the Grand Line, which would give them a head start if they got into the boat. So it's almost, so he says it's almost like a supernatural force is keeping Luffy alive. Right, this very much this this like protagonist syndrome where Luffy is is able to do so much. He's lucky. He's super lucky, just like Zoro was earlier. Also, funny enough. So, in the middle of the storm, the crew decide to make a vow as they're about to enter the Grand Line. They all put their foot onto this barrel and proclaim their dream. Sanji says he wants to find the All Blue Luffy to become King of the Pirates. Zoro to be the world's greatest swordsman, Nami to draw a map of the world, and Usopp to become a brave warrior of the sea. And so as they are heading towards the Grand Line, they reveal that the map that they stole from Buggy shows that the best way to get into the Grand Line is through the entrance at Reverse Mountain, which seems really weird because they have to climb up a mountain to get into the Grand Line, which seems impossible because rivers don't go up mountains. However, Nami points out that this line, this area is very special because this is where the Grand Line and Red Line meet, and that is also where all of the four oceans converge to create strong currents that like whip the water up the river leading up into Reverse Mountain. And so once they get up there, they just ride it up and then they are in the Grand Line. However, while they are explaining this, the ship drifts into this like very strangely Pacific body of water that is it's freakily calm. It is, there is no wind, there are no currents, it is just completely calm. And Nami freaks out, says that, oh no, we're in the calm belt. And the crew is kind of like, what's the big deal? It's not, it's not really that big of an issue. And Nami explains that the Grand Line, you cannot just enter the Grand Line from the four seas, or else anyone would just do it. The Grand Line is sandwiched uh, between these two bodies of water called the calm belts. And in the calm belts, there are no currents, there are no winds, and more horrifyingly, they are filled to the brim with sea kings, which is, they find out as the, a giant army of sea kings just comes out of the water and lifts them up and makes their boat look like a model boat. It is, they are so large. And so, for, they were okay a second ago leaving the storm, and now they want to go back in it, which luckily the sea kings do kind of throw them back into the storm and they head back towards Reverse Mountain. And this is a very big, you know, world-building moment where we learn, like, 
why you can't just go to the end of the grand line. Like, why can't you just like go to like one of the blues and then go to the end of the grand line and find the one piece because you have to go through the actual grand line itself. So after the, the sea beasts throw them back into the storm, the straw hats then arrive at reverse mountain. The strong winds uh, and currents uh, almost throw the Mary off course and into like a post. Fortunately, Luffy, Luffy has some very quick thinking, saves the ship, um, and they get up into, they, they cross the barrier of the, the reverse mountain and end up in the Grand Line. They have made it. Uh, we did it. After 100 chapters, we are finally here. We are finally in the Grand Line. However, these good feelings are very quickly dashed when they realize at the bottom of the reverse mountain is a gigantic whale, which they mistake for a mountain at first before they realize that there are no mountains in the way. That's just a giant whale that is blocking their way. And the whale is extremely scarred for some reason. They slam into the whale, which breaks off the figurehead of the Going Mary, which angers Luffy. And so he starts to attack the whale. However, the whale, pretty unfazed, just swallows the ship whole, sans Luffy. He manages to like fly up. And so inside the whale, the Straw Hats find a house on a small island, along with like smaller sea beasts that are like about the size of their ship. Looks like Master Roshi's island. Yeah, it is. And they realize very quickly that they, they have a moment where they think they're in a dream because they just got eaten by a whale. And the sea beast that attacks them is very quickly subdued by this very old man. He introduces himself as Crocus and confirms that, no, they're they're in the whale. This is not a dream. They're in the whale. He's built this and he vacations here. This is his vacation home. Also, he's very goofy. They threaten to fire the cannons at him. And he says, oh, if you do that, someone will die. And they say, oh, really? Who? He says, me, I will die. <laughs> I like him. <laughs> I like him already. So, but he's this very uh, tall man, kind of wide built, kind of like eggplant shaped as a person. His hair is like a f wilting flower, kind of. And so they also realize that if they're in the whale, this is the stomach and they're in stomach acid, not seawater. And they have to escape quickly before their boat dissolves because Crocus is fine. His island, which is actually a boat, is rimmed with metal so it won't dissolve in the acid. At this moment Crocus explains that the whale is extremely scarred all over its head because it keeps running into the side of the red line over and over again and right on cue the whale starts to do that which causes Crocus to panic. So then Crocus suddenly dives into the stomach acid like unfazed dives into it he goes into this room with this giant syringe full of tranquilizer which he releases to calm the whale down and he also reveals to the audience at this point that this whale's name is Laboon. So meanwhile, Luffy, who managed to not get swallowed, is on top of Laboon, and he realizes that <laughs> Laboon's about to go under the water, and that's not good for him, but he realizes there's this hatch just like sticking out of Laboon, like out of this whale. So he opens up the hatch and climbs inside of Laboon, and there's like a metal chute that he just falls down. While he is falling, we see these two mysterious people that we only know as Mr. Nine and Miss Wednesday. So Mr. Nine is this short guy, he's got like orange hair, and he has a princely, kingly theme going on, he has a crown. Um, he kind of looks like a leprechaun also. I don't know if that's intentional, but he reminds me of a, <laughs> of a leprechaun. Wednesday is, she has like blue hair and a very tight ponytail, very pointy face, and is in a like green... A green or blue dress that's like has swirls on it like a, like a hypnotist and they are making some comment about like hunting this whale so they all end up into the actual stomach itself and luffy accidentally rescues these two people while he like makes his way back to the ship where he's reunited with his crew however immediately after he rescues them these people they attack laboon from the inside and crocus takes the hit but he's like pretty unfazed by it and Luffy immediately knocks these two out. They wanted the meat, they claim, right? They wanted whale meat for their village. So back at Crocus's house, they explain that he explains that they're hunting Laboon to feed their nearby village to get that meat. And he says that he won't let them do it and further elaborates that years ago, a group of friendly pirates came down Reverse Mountain uh, from the West Blue and that baby Laboon had followed them in. This is where we get one of the sadder backstories. I, dude, I, I had forgot how sad this backstory was. It's always the animals. Because he doesn't get it, but he gets it. Ugh. So anyway, anyway, I don't want to 
I don't want to blue balls anybody. Laboon and this crew had traveled together up to that point from the West Blue into Reverse Mountain, but the crew was worried that the Grand Line would be too dangerous for Laboon, and so after they, after they hung out with Crocus for a few months while their ship got repaired, they asked him to watch Laboon for a few years, and that when they came back from circumnavigating uh, the world like Roger had done, then they would take him back with them. Unfortunately, that was 50 years ago. And even though Crocus has explained to Laboon over and over again that they are not coming back, he still thinks that and refuses to, to not believe it. And that's why he is scarred, because he is trying to reunite with his friends by trying to tear down the Red Line, which is a gigantic mountainous continent. And he is making no progress on it whatsoever. He is only hurting himself every time he does it. And in fact, if he doesn't stop, he'll probably kill himself because it, he's doing so much damage to his body. Which is why Crocus explains he set up all of these weird contraptions inside Laboon's body because he's a doctor and it's easier for him to treat him from the inside now than it is to treat him from the outside because he is so monstrously large at this point. Crocus also mentions at this point that he was on a pirate crew for about two years. And so Luffy asks him to join. And he says, I have no interest in taking care of you guys. You're too young for me. Do your own stupid stuff. I'm done being a pirate. So Crocus opens exit uh, for them to leave. And to everyone's surprise, Luffy basically attacks Laboon pretty immediately. But then after this quick fight, Luffy pronounces it a draw and tells Laboon that although his friends not, might not return, he now has a rival in Luffy. And that when Luffy completes his journey, he'll come back and finish the fight. And so Laboon seems to understand and agree to this uh, this proposition. And so Luffy draws his Jolly Roger over Laboon's scars. It's terrible. It looks it looks <laughs> so bad. It looks it looks I don't, it's the exact same Jolly Roger as he, he drew it on his own flag, but it looks worse than that. But he tells them that this mark is their new contract, and that he has to stop ramming the red line, or else he will erase it, and it, it won't be it will be void. And so he when he comes back, he won't fight him. And this is like again to show you like Luffy can change people's hearts and minds, right? Like, this whale just went through this very similar thing with another group of people where this exact same thing just happened. Uh, we're like, oh yeah, we'll be back. But he believes Luffy because Luffy is so confident in himself that it rubs off on everyone else. I think Luffy says that because he fought the whale, right? The whale is like the size of an island, basically, right? And he took hits from the whale He's like, you know I'm strong because you attacked me and I'm still standing. So that's the reason why, believe me when I say I'm going to make it back. Because you fought me and you know I'm strong. Very much like the Kobe thing. Luffy's very emotionally intelligent, but he also just likes punching people. Anyway, so they made this promise now. And so Luffy and them have to come back to see Laboon once they have finished their journey. On the way out, like while this is, like right before this had happened, when they are leaving Laboon, the Straw Hats dump Mr. Nine and Miss Wednesday into the ocean. And as the Straw Hats sail away, the duo mentions something about an organization that will be very interested in pirates like the Straw Hats. And Luffy finds something they dropped, which looks like a bracelet with a compass inside of it. Which then Nami realizes that her compass is broken and spinning like crazy. Crocus tells her that it's, it's actually not broken, it's just that the Grand Line is extremely weird and hard to navigate because it's filled with so many abnormal magnetic fields that make nav navigation difficult and the only way to make it through is with a log pose, which is a special compass that can record magnetic fields. And there are seven magnetic paths to follow once you enter the Grand Line. And essentially, you have to record the magnetic fields that connect one island to another, and then you sail off. Eventually, these seven paths will converge into one final island, known as Raftail, which only the Roger Pirates are known to have landed on. And fortunately for the Straw Hats, the device Luffy found is a log pose. So the strange duo realize that Nami has their log pose from afar when another pair from their organization, Miss Friday and Mr. 13, who are an otter and a vulture, uh, drop a bomb on them as punishment for not completing their mission of capturing Laboon. Realizing that they need help from the Straw Hats, they swim towards them and ask to be taken to their town called Whiskey Peak. Crocus tells them at this point not to trust these guys, but Luffy agrees to take them, um, saying that like, it's not a big deal. I, I'm not worried about it. And Crocus is impressed. And as the Straw Hats sail away into the Grand Line, Crocus says to himself, that boy has a strange air about him. Hey, Roger? Hmm. 
What does that mean? What does that mean? We'll find out later, but for right now, it's time to talk about Whiskey Peak. So, the Straw Hat crew are out in the ocean in the starting leg of the Grand Line. They're quickly introduced to like how abnormal the Grand Line is. They start experiencing ever-changing weather tides, like one second it's sunny, the next second it's snowing, next second it's raining, you know, the weather just keeps changing constantly. And this keeps the crew, save for a sleeping Zoro, on their toes. The They're getting like battered through wind and storm and the crew has to like come together to navigate the craziness of the Grand Line. Meanwhile, Zoro is just sleeping the entire time, right? Eventually, the weather stabilizes and the crew spots an island of cactuses on the horizon. There's these giant cactuses and underneath them is a town right and this town is called whiskey peak upon reaching the town mr nine and wednesday miss wednesday they thank the crew and they jump ship uh, much to the crew's confusion since they got to this island they realized that they need time for the log post that they just got to reset because how it works is when you get to an island the log post has to acclimate to that island's magnetic signature and that can take minutes to hours to days to weeks even and once it does that i'll point them to the next island right so i just want to take a side a side combo here i think this is a really cool idea from oda as a narrative device to make it so Whenever they go to an island, they have to stay for a little bit and explore and have an adventure before they go to the next one, right? It's just a really cool idea to do that. It's one of the ways that One Piece separates itself from other shonen in that it's an action adventure shonen, right? It, like the adventure part is very important, and like you said, the log pose allows us to have those adventures while also there's a sense of urgency because they have to get to the end of the Grand Line at some point, but also they have to take it slow and do the adventure stuff. So while the log pose uh, needs time to reset, the crew have no choice but to dock at this mysterious island they've come across. Much to their surprise, the residents, when they get on the island, welcome them as if they're heroes. They soon meet the town's leader, Ega Rope Boy. He looks kind of like a Mozart looking dude with a saxophone. He has like the powdered wig and everything. So they meet this guy, he's the town's leader, Ega Rope Boy, and he treats them to a party. They're, everyone here is like very excited to see these pirates and greet them very warmly. However, when Nami asks Igaropoi, um, how long it would take to set the log pose. He says, oh, don't, don't worry about uh, things like that. That's not important. Just party it up. So the crew quickly take to the place, you know, eating, drinking, and flirting long into the night until they eventually all fall asleep, right? There, there are these scenes of like Usopp telling his one story about how he defeated a fishman. Zoro is drinking everyone under the table luffy is eating the chef under the table right the chef's like please no more i can't cook anymore and and luffy's like another um nami there's a scene where nami drinks a nun under the table she also out drank zoro because zoro out drank 10 men and nami out drank 12 exactly but it's a, it's a weird thing about drinking the nun under the table because that that implies that Catholicism exists in One Piece, which we can go into later, I guess. But, you know, also, why is the nun drinking? Anyway, One Piece Jesus didn't die for her sins for no reason. She's drinking the blood of Christ. That's oh, what God. she's drinking. Drinking the piss of Christ. So, unfortunately, after all this goes down and, like, everyone eventually falls asleep, turns out that Ikaropoi, the town leader that invited them in, Turns out that Igarupoi, the town leader that invited them in, he turns out to be Mr. Eight. And the nun that Nami drank under the table is Miss Monday. There are also other townspeople who are operatives as well. And turns out they are agents of this elusive crime syndicate called Baroque works they recognize luffy from his bounty poster and they're kind of shocked that it's like 30 million 
right? And they decide to go after him and his crew because the town's a little bit worse for wear. As you mentioned before, you know, the two operatives that were in the whale were trying to kill the whale for the whale meat because the town is like in need of food and supplies and stuff, right? So they see this 30 million bounty rookie and they decide, you know, it's time to take him out and get his bounty, right? However, Zoro and Nami had both faked passing out, thwarting their surprise attack. So they go and try to attack the Straw Hat crew, but Zoro and Nami were faking it and weren't asleep. And Zoro ends up defending the crew. Turns out this syndicate called Baroque Rooks only operates with assignments delegated by the leader who like every other member has a number and they all remain secret and anonymous to each uh, kind of to each other. Zoro knows this because at one point he was recruited because if you remember Zoro first occupation was bounty hunter and these guys are bounty hunters as well so at one point he was recruited and he knows that kind of a bit how Baroque Works works um, with the different agents and all of that. This is also why, if you've seen the live action, which just came out pretty recently, you would know that Zoro's first scene in that is him killing a guy named Mr. Seven, who is a part of Baroque Works. Uh, that does happen canonically. It's not ever shown, it's just mentioned um, that he did kill Mr. Seven. And this is how he knows about it. And that's why that's in that scene, or in that series, even though that does not happen in the first four arcs another cool part here is that when zoro reveals that he's been recruited at one point uh to the town mayor or at this point mr eight as he's called uh he says fine another tombstone to add to the cactus turns out the giant cactus that overhangs the town from far away it looks like it has needles on it Turns out, those aren't needles. Those are tombstones. And there are just hundreds upon hundreds of tombstones on this giant cactus. I think there are way too many tombstones. But, I mean, if they've been set up there for a while, I guess there could be that many. Well, it's weird because they do mention that, like, they they were given this town. So, like, I don't know if Baroque Works has been there for a while. But, like, these, these people in particular have not been there mm. very long. Because they say that, like, they were given the town to guard. There's a lot of tombstones. All I'm saying, there's a lot of tombstones on this this fake cactus. Um, so, turns out the entire town is basically just bounty hunters. From the nuns, to the cooks, to even little kids. They're all bounty hunters. And what they do is, since they're close to the entrance of the Grand Line, uh, they prey upon new pirates who get into the grand line and they take their bounties as soon as they get there right because going up reverse mountain takes a toll on a lot of pirates so they're kind of easy pickings once they get to whiskey peak um so the town is bounty hunters and they attempt to murder Zoro, who, without much effort, like, just starts knocking people out. He's knocking out grandmothers, he's knocking out little kids, he, school teachers, firemen, like, the whole town's a front and he's just knocking people out as they try to attack him. Um, this leaves Mr. Eight and Mr. Nine and Miss Monday as well as Miss Wednesday, uh, anxious, but they're still alive. They're they're still up um, as Zoro goes on this rampage. Uh, at this moment, Zoro is ambushed again by some more bounty hunters, but he quickly takes care of them before overpowering Miss Monday, uh, who is a black woman, might I add. Not dodging the allegations. Yes, he's not dodging. Zoro's not dodging the allegations. He palms this black woman's face and lifts her up with one hand as she's like bleeding and then like t 
tosses her after he he beat her up right this of course pisses off uh mr eight who shoots bullets out of his saxophone right because he had the saxophone from earlier uh mr nine and miss wednesday they also go and try to attack zoro uh the latter of which miss wednesday she tries to hypnotize zoro um but she misses because her mount karu who for all intents and purposes is just a chocobo it's a chocobo but more on the duck side right it's like a giant duck that she rides she charges him trying to like hypnotize him but the chocobo like charges in the wrong direction so zoro escapes um and as zoro escapes he's found by mr nine who has like metal bats but the tops can pop off and there's like metal wire connecting the two pieces and this guy restrains zoro's left arm with this metal wire um as miss wednesday shows up again uh holding luffy hostage so miss wednesday shows up holding luffy hostage but it's hit by mr nine the king dude from earlier right and zoro uses him as a shield from mr eight's attack uh, the dude with the saxophone and that takes out mr nine and so zoro easily takes out mr eight as well ikaropoi the town leader with the saxophone um soon after this mr five shows up he's a black man with like freeform dreads and a designer coat and his partner miss valentine who is a slender woman in a sundress uh, that kind of has lemons on it and she's carrying an umbrella they arrive but they're not here to help the members that were defeated already they're here because they discovered a spy they revealed that their leader uh, mr. zero of baroque works has discovered a spy in their organization and they've been sent to eliminate them. Yes, actually there are two uh, two spies and that they are both members of royalty from the kingdom of Alabasta. Igoropoi, realizing that his cover is blown, he attacks Mr. Five and tells Miss Wednesday to run for it, who in a moment of panic reveals that Igoropoi's name is actually Igaram. And, but Mr. Five very easily retaliates and reveals uh, that Igaram is the royal guard of the Kingdom of Alabasta and that Miss Wednesday's true identity is Nefertiri Vivi, the princess of Alabasta. Mr. Nine, who doesn't know what is going on, tells Vivi that she's his partner and that he begins defending her. Uh, however, he's quickly, he's just as quickly taken down as Igaram was. And Igram, while this is happening, asked Zoro to defend and escort Vivi to Alabasta, which is then where we're introduced to Nami again, who did the same ploy that Zoro did where she also pretended to pass out drunk and she was never actually that drunk. So Nami agrees to help Igram, and as Vivi tries to run away on Karu, Miss Monday also decides to help Vivi, basically saying the same thing that Mr. Nine said about, like, I don't know what is happening here, but you're my friend. You're a friend of my partner, so I'm going to help you. But she is also very quickly defeated by Mr. Five, who reveals that he has eaten the Boom Boom fruit, and that he can turn any body part of his into dynamite. So normally what he does is he picks his nose, and he flicks burgers at people, and they explode, which is really gross. gross but in this instance he just like clotheslines miss monday and like blows her up basically and igarim explains to nami that supposedly the leader of baroque works wants to create a utopia while this is happening luffy finally wakes up um and he asks the townspeople who he assumes are who still assumes are good people because he has no clue what's been happening the last like few hours um, he asks them what happened, and they tell him that Zoro attacked them, um, which makes Luffy very angry because they fed him, which 
as we will learn as this series goes on, if you feed Luffy, he is your best friend. So he's on their side, he starts attacking Zoro, and Zoro tries to explain to him what is going on, um, and Luffy doesn't, he refuses to listen. And so Zoro just keeps dodging Luffy's attacks before he finally just kicks him into Mr. Five and Miss uh, Valentine, who are like, what is happening? They're like, what the, what the fuck is going on? Like, we were fighting you, and now you're fighting each other, and yet you're still also fighting us? I don't know what is happening here. So Luffy is still very angry at Zoro, and just like randomly defeats Mr. Five off screen. Like, he just beats him like one hit, which like kind of upsets Miss Valentine, and she's like, I'm flying away now. I ate the Kilo Kilo fruit, so I'm as light as one kilo, so I can fly now. And Luffy is just like, dead set on fighting Zoro. He refuses to acknowledge that these people even exist, and he's just like, why would you hurt my new friend Zoro? What is wrong with you? So, uh, <laughs> Luffy and Zoro keep fighting. They just, uh, Zoro's like, fine, if you want to fight, I will, sh I will show you a real fight, but don't be mad when I kill you. So they have a pretty intense fight, and Mr. Five and Miss Valentine try to like, intervene, and they're like, take us seriously, and they're like, Shut up, this is not about you. And they like both knock them out in one hit. He literally one shot them. Is also the panel it's is so uncharacteristically good. detailed compared to like the rest of what Oda has drawn so far. I don't, it looks like another artist at this point. That's how good it looks. It's weird. It is very good. Um, it's clean and it, it just it's really intense. Uh, it's a good set of panels for these, these two pages. So Eventually, Luffy calms down. He's like, why didn't you explain this to me? And Zoro's like, I was trying and you would not listen. So they begin a conversation with Vivi and Ernest, um, who reveals that Brokework's stated goal of creating a utopia is a lie, and that they actually want to conquer Alabasta, which is again her home country. She also accidentally lets it slip that the leader of Baroque Works is Sir Crocodile, one of the seven warlords of the sea. So just like Mihawk, he is also a warlord, which if you've listened to our episode with Captain Marrow, that is essentially like a privateer in our real world. So Igram then shows up disguised as Vivi in her dress um, and says that even though Crocodile's bounty is no longer active, when it was active, it was 81 million. So if we're like using this as like a power scaling technique, which is wrong, don't do that. Don't do that. However, if you use as a rough estimate if you need to, then Crocodile is like at least four times as strong as Arlong. At least, because again, his bounty is frozen. It's, a, it's important thing to remember about the Warlords. The bounty that they have is not a true indication of their strength because it is frozen. He then also gives Nami an eternal log pose to Alabasta. And so basically this is like a log pose, but it only goes to Alabasta. It cannot be reset, um, but it'll always go there. And so they uh, they tell them to follow this pose and it'll get there in about three or four islands. With that, he sails off to distract Baroque Works, but his ship is blown up almost immediately in this like horrific fire. It is. It lights up the island. He doesn't even get a page. It's just one panel, ship, next panel, explosion. Vivi is obviously devastated. This has like been one of her best friends. But Nami comforts her, tells her that it's okay, that Usopp, Sanji, Zoro, and Luffy save the East Blue all by themselves, and that taking down a warlord will be no problem. Luffy then grabs the still sleeping Sanji and Usopp and drags them to the Going Merry. But when they arrive and start sailing, the second in command of Baroque Works, Miss All Sunday, has somehow managed to sneak on their ship after apparently killing Igarim. She then tells the Straw Hats that she's not on assignment to kill them, but she does taunt them. By using her supposed devil fruit powers, we never actually see them in action, but she does some weird stuff like stealing Luffy's hat while while still remaining on one of the banners of the ship. And she offers them a different eternal pose to Alabasta that is essentially like a blank route that will be easier and that her, her organization does not know the path through and that they will get to Alabasta in One Piece, supposedly. One Piece. <laughs> Luffy smashes it and says that she will not dictate how they arrive in Alabasta, and this intrigues Miss All Sunday. And she says that if he survives, 
then they will meet again. And she explains that their next stop is Little Garden, which might not even require Baroque Works to intervene to kill them because they might just die there. And so she leaves, and as the arc closes, we see a brief panel of Little Garden, which has these huge, angry, ferocious tigers and footprints the size of those tigers. And that's where we will end this off, and we'll uh, next week we will visit Little Garden. Yeah, so these few arcs are interesting. I think, um, I think, so these are three separate arcs, technically. It's a uh, Log Town, Reverse Mountain, and Whiskey Peak. I think individually, um, they are kind of weak. However, together, they're interesting because they really set up some long-term goals for the series, especially Baroque works. Um, I have very fond memories of this section of One Piece, not only because I grew up, again, on the 4Kids sub where this was like the prime time that they were showing this, but also just because it is like the first time that it's not, they're working towards a bigger goal while doing other stuff, right? Everything before this is very episodic and the Baroque work stuff is like, you is always in the back of your mind because for the next few arcs, that it's just going to be dealing with Baroque works, um, even if they're not dealing with Baroque works. And I I really enjoy that. Oda chose a good theme here with the secret agents because that lends itself to, you know, it always being in the back of your mind because, you know, when we meet certain characters later on, could they be in Baroque works? Could they not? Who knows? You know, secret organization stuff is really cool and really intriguing to the reader it keeps them reading and watching i think i agree and it really fits in with that adventure theme it's not just entirely battles it's like a battle of wits with this uh, this organization all right so that about wraps up the actual episode but before we leave i do want to talk about the question of the day so this one today doesn't come from any particular person i'm just interested in your thoughts on this since the live action has just come out as we record this episode what is your favorite part about the live action One Piece and your least favorite part? So my favorite part of the live action would be how they how they manage to get characters off of a page into real life, if that makes sense, right? I feel like all the casting choices they made for the characters in One Piece were almost spot on right uh a lot of the characters look exactly like or almost exactly like how they would look in real life uh i like how they edited some of them uh for ex for instance like usopp doesn't have his long nose but i still think the actor they got for usopp is brilliant and fits him perfectly I also really love, like, he, he lies, like, he lies all the time in ways that are, like, inconsequential. It feels very much like he is, like, he's just attuned to lying. So it's not just, like, this grandiose statement. It's like, yeah, I've definitely shot a cannon before. And it, it like, it really, it feels real in a way that, like, I think the other characters just quite don't. And it makes sense because he's the most human of the Straw Hats. Exactly. Like, they had this bar scene. And I can't remember the specific lies, but Usopp is just lying casually. And it took me a second to catch that he was lying. Like, yeah. it just sounded like he was bragging. And I was like, oh, this is how they're working in, you know, the lies into his character. He just, he brags about stuff uh, that he hasn't done yet. Much like the manga, but in a more ris realistic way, like you said. Um... Now, what don't I like about the live action? What's my least favorite part? My least favorite part... Can I... I'm going to give you a funny answer. Okay. My least favorite part is the way Luffy stares into the camera for 30 seconds on end. And oh, they don't so cut bad. away. It's like, so why do... <laughs> why do so they bad. do that? Like, just cut away. It's, like, if you played it... I swear to God. Play it on mute, the sections where he's just staring into the camera. Like, if you take away the music, it gives more sociopath, psychopath vibes than it does, like, 
Luffy being goofy and funny vibes. Right? It's it's there, and it's like the big two are when he fights Kuro and then when he fights Arlong, he's like his eyes just like roll, roll to the back of his head. And it <laughs> it doesn't look right. It feels so wrong. Why is he staring into the camera, bro? I mean, I don't know. They were never gonna get him perfect, right? They were never gonna get Luffy perfect. But they got as close as they could. They just had some mishaps, like staring into the camera for too long. Uh, I'm hoping that it's just know. that Inyaki Adoi is like young and inexperienced, and that like they can work through that because they clearly have this perfect casting choice. Like in terms of mm -hmm. appearance, I will say my favorite part is kind of what you said is is the casting choices. I think that they nailed it. In particular, I already mentioned Usopp. I think he is surprisingly like just so understated. Um, and then I also really love Sanji. I think he's really funny and suave and has this really nice energy. And he also helps um, Zoro bounce off of him very well. So like when they're fighting in Arlong Park, that feels so Zoro and Sanji. And it feels good. It, it's really good. Nami is great the whole way through. In particular, my favorite uh, actor, bar none, is Buggy. Uh, I think that actor it. did so well. He's really funny and, and clownish, but also he's really scary and terrifying, which is exactly what Buggy was like um, in that first arc. And so mm -hmm. I, the arc in particular was also just like probably my favorite. Um, although it's, it's a little weird. It's got some weird issues, but like the ambiance of it, loved it. My least favorite is probably the characterization of most of the characters, in particular Luffy. I don't really like the way that he is written. Um, as I've mentioned before in the past few episodes of the podcast, I really like the fact that Luffy ends up on an island somewhere. He has no, like the first few islands, he like has no reason to really intervene. And yet he makes an actual decision to intervene and help people. And it shows like how deep his character is and that like he has no he has no reason to help um uh he has he has no reason to help Orange Town or Sir Village, and yet he still does because he is that good of a person. And the way that it kind of is the way that the story is written in the live action is that he is forced into defending himself and like in doing so he also helps out these people and it also leads to like luffy feeling a little more selfish than he is in the actual series yeah i can um, see that it's not my favorite i hope like i think it makes sense as an american adaptation and i think that like within the context of the story that they are telling it makes sense but mm -hmm. Me personally, I'm not a fan of the way that happened. Um, but... I will say, I will say that overall, the the One Piece live action it gives me it gives me early 2000s. Remember that time in the early 2000s where they tried to make animated movies into real life, like oh, the like Garfield the, like... movie or something like, like cat that. in a hat or like yeah. yeah it gives me that vibes a and little bit not yeah. a terrible way in a good and bad way right it gives me that I, vibes i think this is the best the best uh i think this is the best we could have asked for out of a live action adaptation yes, As, aside from like some some characterization and writing choices i think as as a whole this the is tone, the, the way they went about it. Exactly. The, the tone, they, they, the they, setting, they, they, the ambiance. I yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it's it's really good. And I'm excited about more of it. Um I'm interested Oh, I also like that they weaved in Garp, even though he doesn't show up until way later. Way later. Um but He was cool though. Uh yeah, I like all that stuff. So yeah, overall I would I say I really do enjoy the live action. Um, but you know, it's not perfect. So Nothing is. 
Nothing is. Um, except our podcast. I would, that's, I would agree with that. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, no, uh, no qualms to be had here. No room for improvement. So if you want to follow us on social media, you follow, follow uh, at Some Peace Pod on any social media that we are on. You follow me at SunnyGirlLYK on anything that I am on. And me at Emperor Zone on Twitter. Um, and with that, uh, thanks for listening and we will catch you guys later. Bye.